Rowling. I'm honored to be interviewed by Alex Jones, a truth seeker, fighting for justice in America. Now he's charming me. He's getting me all smiling. <laughs> Aaron, when did you start to think something was wrong in the world or start to find out about the whole banking cartel and the Federal Reserve System, the, the New World Order? Well, that, that was a, a progression of events. Uh, I became very, I'm, I've always been a very independent person, always believed in individuality, and that we were put on this earth to be uh, unique individuals to fulfill our God-given potential and that uh, the only way to fulfill your potential is to be free to find out who you are and to make your errors, to make mistakes. And as, I, as uh, I grew up, I began to realize more and more the government was inhibiting me in things that I wanted to do. And uh, what happened, uh, I was very successful in the ladies' lingerie business. I worked for my dad. He had a small undergarment business. And I created the first ladies' bikini panties back in 1963, actually. And then I opened up a, um, a nightclub in Chicago called the Electric Theater uh, that, that opened up the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Wow. All right? And so the city of Chicago was in flames the day my club opened. Wow. And nobody came out to the club. And um, well, what happened was that... Um, uh, that was the year of the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 68. And so my club became a hangout for the hippies, you know, and because they, they wanted to go to Chicago and protest what was going on. And I was having a concert at my club one night to raise money. And uh, the police uh, raided the nightclub, my club for no reason at all. And uh, I was standing outside my, in my office looking, overlooking the street. And I saw all these paddy wagons pulling up in front of my club. And I was a 24-year-old kid. You know, I had no experience at all, really. I said, what are these paddy wagons doing here? And then I saw all these cops getting out of the paddy wagons coming into my club. I said, oh, my God, they're raiding me. And so uh, I ran down to the stage, and I got on the stage, and I stopped the band from playing. And I said to the people in the audience, we're being raided, you know, so uh, sit down on the floor, cooperate, you know, you know, and... Uh, uh, plot your identification and cooperate with the police. And as I said that, uh, two of the cops from behind threw me onto the floor and grabbed me and, and started dragging me out of the club. Uh, and uh, I'm going, you know, victory, victory, you know, playing it for all it was worth at the time. I was a kid. And, uh, uh, and then I saw the fire department there, and the fire department was dumping garbage cans, the garbage, all over the floor. And I thought to myself, well, why are they doing that? And you know, very quickly, as, I was as they were dragging me out. And I didn't quite understand it. So they threw me into the paddy wagon. As I got into the paddy wagon, one of the cops grabbed my testicles from behind and squeezed. And I went into the paddy wagon in gigantic pain. And uh, the next person that came into the paddy wagon, the cop, as he was stepping in, the cops took the billy club, smashed him on the head with it, and just split his skull, you know, for no reason. I mean, there was nothing wrong. So that was kind of your wake up. That was my awakening. Like, what is going on? I, I thought this was America. So I, I initially blamed it on Chicago and Mayor Daly. Think it was just it was, it was Chicago. And anyway, I went on the I went. It was the headlines of the newspapers the next day. You know, there was my picture in the newspapers. Headlines: Electric theater short circuited. It was raided. And in the article, uh, they went ahead and they said that uh, the reason they raided the club was because the fire department came there and saw it was messy full of garbage and the hippies started attacking them, which was totally not true. Those dirty hippies? It was, yeah, it was totally false. You know, it, was, it was a complete fabrication. So they ran a false flag on you. They yeah. you. Yeah, they, of course. You know, and uh, I was in shock. I said, people lie like that? People actually do these things? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it was an awakening to me. And I went on television, I told people on television that they lied. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what the truth was. You know, it was shocking to me. Um, and then a, 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 week or, a week or two weeks later, I forget exactly what it was, uh, two, two cops come to see me, a lieutenant and a, and a sergeant, a captain and a sergeant. And they said, Mr. Russo, we're sorry if you got hurt that night at the club and the raid, but... Uh, we're here to tell you that if you want to keep the club open, it's going to take uh, $2,000 a month, and we're going to come see you once a month, and whenever we have to raid you, we're going to call you, 
you know, and we'll let you know we're going to come in tonight and raid you. This was mafia. Uh, well, the police mafia, Yeah. you know. And uh, actually, it was actually actually more interesting that they said, listen, there's the A plan, there's the B plan, and there's the super deluxe plan. And this one, of course, each one, of course, that much money a month. Which one do you want? What was I, the super deluxe? That's the one I took. That was a 2000 a month plan. And I took that plan, and um, I paid them $2,000 a month, and they left me alone. And whenever they were going to raid the club, they would come there, we're going to raid, we're going to have a phony raid tonight, you know, just to look good for the people in the neighborhood, you know. So that was your first big education? That was my education into corruption in government, you know. But I really thought that was basically Chicago. I didn't realize it was the whole country was like that. And so that was my wake-up call, that people lie and cheat and steal. And uh, I thought everybody was always honest and nice and decent. And uh, I had no idea about any of these things. Finally, one day they came to me and they said, look, we, we, we can't take your money anymore. I said, why, what's up? What's going on? I said, we have to close your club. This election's coming, and the aldermen and the neighbor don't want you open anymore. So we can't take your money. So I had to go to court and fight them, and uh, they were trying to close the club. And then one night there was a fire, and the club never reopened again. It was, they, the club just closed, and that was the end of the club. And they, they, they burned me down. And that, that was the end of my experience. And then I moved back to New York, where I met Bette Midler. And uh, I uh, ran into her at a little uh, nightclub she was playing called The Improv. And I thought she was fabulous. And through a series of events, I began managing her. And as soon as I started managing her, her career took off like a rocket. You know, it was just for, fortuitous, I guess. And um, uh, we became very, very successful. And through managing Bet, I started producing shows on Broadway where I won the Tony and I produced a television show where I won the Emmy with Dustin Hoffman and Bet, you know, and then uh, I produced The Rose for her, where she got Academy Award nominations. Wow. And then that led me to producing Trading Places, which everybody knows. You I know, think it's the best Eddie Murphy movie. Well, it's a good one. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a really good one. And I'm very proud I made that movie. And so, in, in, in my mind, um, I feel as if I've made a classic comedy in Trading Places a classic musical in The Rose, and a classic documentary in Freedom to Fascism. You know, so I'm very proud of my work that I've done as a filmmaker. Back in, uh, in the late 80s, I was a pretty big silver trader and gold trader. And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story on tape before. Uh, I was a pretty big silver and gold trader. And um, the... Uh, I took, and I always paid my taxes, and I took what was a legal tax deduction on my silver trades. And uh, a few years later, I think it was 88 or 89 or something, the uh, IRS claimed that what I did, and other people did as well, was now illegal. We couldn't do it anymore. But they made it retroactive. I said, what do you mean retroactive? It was legal then. We do, I did what was legal. He said, yeah, but it's now we're making it illegal retroactively. And you, it, that's not good. So you owe us six hundred or $800,000. For what? It was legal. How could you make something retroactive? Change the law backwards in time. It makes no sense. Well, we're doing it. And so everybody said they can't do that. So he went to court, a class action lawsuit. And the judge agreed with the IRS and said they could do it retroactively. And that's when I knew that there was something wrong in America with the IRS and the system here, you yeah. know. Aaron, you were telling me this story last night, uh, and before you even finished saying, in the late 80s, the tax law, I said retroactive. And I knew that because they literally ruined my dad, but, but he paid. He, he didn't know. He still thought this was America. And uh, it, it was legal tax law, what you're supposed to do. They said retroactively you owe and with... Not just retroactive, but they said you also have penalties and interest. That's right. So how do you have penalties and interest on something when they retroactively change the law? Well, first of all, you can't retroactively. Well, first of all, you can't retroactively. Be, how can you? How can you do anything retroactively? Penalties and interest are a farce. The whole thing because they do whatever they want to do, and that's when I realized America is not America. It's not the land that I was taught it was, because they can do whatever they wish to do. And there's nothing the citizen can do about it. Now, you've made America Freedom of Fascism. I want to walk through that film, and I want to encourage everybody out there to, to uh, get a copy of it on DVD. It was also in theaters around the country, and the, I think the best film out there on the Federal Reserve and the IRS and the whole 
banker scam, and I want to discuss that with you here. Uh, but I wanted to uh, go back a little bit uh, to the point that we discussed uh, last night where you don't advise people to not pay. And I do the same thing. People say, well, wait, you're saying it's a scam, but you're saying go ahead and pay it. And I like the way you summed it up. Well, it's really fairly simple. I mean, uh, since making that movie, you know, many people come to me and ask me whether they should pay their income taxes or not, you know, and I never advise people not to pay. And the reason I, I tell them, I say, look, I've done a lot of research. There isn't, the Supreme Court has ruled that the IRS has no authority. The 16th Amendment did not give the IRS the authority to tax your labor and your wages. That's a fact, all right? The Supreme Court is the law of the land, you know, and, and, the, and the IRS does not trump the Supreme Court. However, that being the case, the fact is, if the mafia would come to you and say, we want $2,000 a month that we're going to hurt you, I would not advise you not to pay them, because you may get hurt by not paying them. Whether it's legal or not, doesn't necessarily matter. You're going to get hurt if you don't. It's the same thing with the IRS. They can hurt you. They can put you in jail. They can torture you. So if you don't pay them, you may get hurt. So I never advise people not to pay. You know, I tell people, yeah, pay your taxes. Look what happened to Congressman but, Hansen. Yeah, Congressman Hansen's a great example. Pay your taxes. But you know what? Shut down the Federal Reserve System, and eventually you won't have to pay those taxes anymore. See, the, the, the IRS is a symptom of the problem. The real problem the, is the banking industry and the bankers in this country. That's where the real problem lies. That's the root of our problem. Well, that's why we've lost America. Okay? So, yeah, pay your taxes. Because if you don't pay them, you might get hurt. And I've heard all the arguments, you know, uh, how, what tax protesters say and so on and so forth. And I don't call them tax protesters. I call them the tax honesty movement. Because they're being honest, you know, at least. But the fact of the matter is, you, you're being forced, you're being compelled to pay it because you're facing jail sentences, you're facing time, you're facing corruption of the courts if you don't pay, right? And so you pay it, because you, just like you pay the mafia. But with the mafia, at least you have the government to call and try and help you to get past the mafia, to protect you. Here you have nobody to, pr to protect you. The, the, the American people are living in a matrix. They don't understand the truth of how things are working in this country, you know? And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The very fact is that if you, if you ask 100 people on the street, what kind of government is America supposed to be? 99% of them will tell you a democracy. America is supposed to be a democracy. But that's a lie. That's an illusion. The word democracy is not written into the Constitution at one time. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. The Founding Fathers hated the idea of a democracy. They thought it was the worst form of government there is, and I agree with them, because in a democracy, 51% of the people control 49% of the people. If you're part of the 49%, you're not free. America was founded as a constitutional republic, and in that constitutional republic that we have, 99% of the people can't take away the rights of 1%. You have your rights because you were born with them. You have God-given human rights that nobody can take away from you. The government, the majority, no matter who they are, I can't take away your rights. And that's what, that's, that's what our founding fathers gave us. But the psychological operations that they, that they do to us, they make us believe that we're a democracy and that majority rules, you see? And they want you to believe that. Because then they tell you, this poll says, this many want this and this many want that and this many want this, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Well, Hitler was elected. Hitler was elected. Hitler did everything legally. And in a re constitutional republic, a minority is, pro is protected against a majority. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin, a paraphrase, that said, democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner? Exactly. And then he also said, in a republic, the sheep would have a gun <laughs> 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 to protect himself. You know, and that's, that's, that's the truth. America is not a democracy. But you ask the most intelligent people what form of government America is supposed to be, they'll say a democracy. Because that's what, that's what they've been brainwashed. They've been psyoped into believing that. They believe that we're in Iraq. They believe we're in Iraq to promote democracy. The word democracy, you hear George Bush saying democracy means freedom. No, democracy equals new world order. Democracy equals slavery. The word democracy is not synonymous with freedom. It's the opposite of freedom. 
Democracy is the worst form of government you can have because it's majority rule. And the government can tell you exactly what they want to tell you to do. Because the, the majority wants it. I don't care what the majority wants. I live my life as I choose. And if I don't commit violence, theft, or fraud against another human being, I can live my life as I wish. That's my choice. And if I'm allowed to make mistakes, because when you make mistakes, you learn from them. You grow as a human being. We're put on this earth to become the best individuals we can be, to fulfill our God-given potential. Right? We're not here to put on the earth so that the government can tell us how to live our lives and what we must do. We put into these systems and these paradigms. No. The same thing in health. You know, if you're sick, you have to have a certain protocol. Nonsense. You know, be individuals, think for yourself, have critical thinking, you know. And so what's happened is that because they've taught everybody that we're a democracy, which is not true, now, so then in 1913, they bring the Federal Reserve System into being, right? And now you have this Federal Reserve System, which then in 1913 got the right to create money for the government, when before that the government created its own money. Now, now the government, when it needed money, had to borrow it from this private bank called the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank owned by individuals, incorporated in Delaware. And so um, what happens is now the government borrows money from them to fund the government. Then the government says, well, we have to pay these people interest. How are we going to pay them interest? Let's impose a tax on the labor of the American people, which never existed before, to pay the interest to the bankers. In fact, in 1980, Ronald Reagan said not one red cent uh, of your income tax money goes to run the country. It all goes to the Federal Reserve. Well, it, go, what the, it was the Grace Commission report that said that uh, all the, not one nickel goes to the infrastructure of the country. You know, uh, I guess Reagan quoted that. Then, right. So. And so, um, but the point, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that by creating this Federal Reserve system, the government now became dependent on these private banks for money. And they started take, taxing us, you see. And so now, now what happens is that um, in 35, I believe it was, Social Security started. And they gave Social Security cards, said not to be used for identification, the Social Security number right on the card, right? And through Social Security, they started deducting money out of your, out of your paycheck. That was the first time they were ever take, could take money out of your paycheck, because people agreed to it because they thought it was going to the retirement fund. And so then when they instituted the income tax again, they started taking money out of your paycheck because Social Security could do it. So then, then they could do it again. You see what I'm saying? And so now they've even taken control of the tax, the, the tax payment itself. I mean, literally like you're a slave, they're right. taking it right there when you make it. Exactly. They don't even trust the public enough to, to go send and them a check. Themselves, you know? Right. So they take it out automatically because they know people aren't going to want to pay it. So what's happened is that through the implementation of the Federal Reserve System, the government has become uh, vested in these bankers and they get their money from the bankers. And so then they impose a tax on us, which makes us more slaves, makes it more difficult for us to survive, right? Giving them more profits. And now what's happened is that uh, through the, the, the Federal Reserve System, the bankers have pretty much taken control of our government. It doesn't matter Republican and Democrat anymore because they're both the same. Neither one of them are talking about shutting down the Federal Reserve System or stopping the payment of taxes, you know, uh, or any of the big issues that face Americans, right? So uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family. And he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish, and the goals of the uh, goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks, and they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country, 
but yet at the same time we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is getting me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what everything, you sell. Everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people, and you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? Uh, I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said, uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And um, he's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told him what the event was going to be. But there was going to be an event. And out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the New World Order. And we'd go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later, 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. He told you it was going to be a hoax. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no question. He says, there's going to be war on terror. And he's laughing. There's no... <laughs> Who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11, who were able to, can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people into subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And that's why we, and that was the first lie and the next lie was going into Iraq, you know, uh, to uh, get Saddam Hussein out with his weapons of mass destruction. That was the next lie. Now, now specifically, this was a little over six years ago? This was... Uh, 11 months before 9-11. Yeah. And Nick Rockefeller, who's a lawyer, he is, he, he's become your friend over the previous years. And he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror and it's just going to go on and on. Right. An endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. 
that you can never so you can never define a winner. And, and uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy? It just goes yeah, on. Yeah, because just, you can't define a winner. There's no one who is on to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud because people are intimidated against saying it. Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Let's but, the truth, but the truth has to be, the truth has to come out. That's why I'm doing this interview. The fact of the matter happens to be that the whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. Yeah, there's a war going on in Iraq because we invaded Iraq. And people over there fighting, you know. But the war on terror, that's a joke, you know. And until we discover what really happened on 9 11, and who was responsible for 9 11, because that's where the war on terror emanates from. That's where it comes from. It was 9 11 that allowed this war on terror to begin. And until we get to the bottom root of 9 11, the truth of 9 11, we'll never know about the war on terror. Aaron, you said that he was, and I think it's important, and I know this about the Rockefellers from Dr. Dennis Cuddy and many others, who literally, you'll be 20 years old in a lunch line at college, and no, it's David Rockefeller. And he hears here, I mean, they're experts at recruiting and getting what they call players, and that clearly he was, I mean, I want to make it specific and just get you to reiterate what you said last night uh, about you were, you got 30% of the vote, you were having an effect, you, you, you made mad as hell, they knew that you'd started the Constitution Party, yeah. they knew that you were uh, somebody who was taking action and getting things done, you'd already made some big films, had a lot of other successes, right. so they were trying to recruit you, and, and, and didn't it come down to the point of, hey, we are here to recruit you, and don't worry, your chip's going to say, don't mess with us, you know, this guy's uh, don't touch. Yeah, yes, that did happen. Now, I was definitely being recruited, but it's more subtle than that. Well, in your words, just go through the process, and then, and then what do you say? Well, well, what it is is, I remember, we were friends, and we used to have, he used to come to my house a lot, we'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments, how you get involved in, you know, or they would help me with this business investment or that business investment. And was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them, but was I interested in that? And, uh, you know, just uh, just stuff, you know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because well, that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways were, the, were on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people, you know, and... Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Or? Well, it would be more like, you it's know... It's better for them. Well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serfs. They're just people. You know, it was it was just a lack of caring, you know, and that's just not who I was. It was just sort of like cold, you know. It was just like cold, you know. And uh, I used to say to him, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need. You have all the power you need. What's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society. To have, the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. What, and, and, and I said, all, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, it, most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Because America is becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he brought, we were, he was at the house one night and uh, we were talking, he would talk and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. Let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He said, there were two primary reasons. 
And they were, one reason was we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib. And the second reason was now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up the family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim primary reasons for women's live, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. You know? Aaron, did you know that Gloria Steinem, in one of her own books, now admits the CIA funded Miss Magazine? No, I had no idea about that. No, I never heard that. Yeah, we're going to... CIA funded Ms. Magazine? Funded Ms. Magazine with the stated goal of taxing women and breaking up the family. No kidding. I never heard that. Well, Nick told me. I mean, I mean, I know it, but not because I know the CIA was involved in it. Well, she, Gloria Steinem was proud of it. Oh, the CIA wanted to help me help women. No and, kidding. And so they funded it. Yeah. And, and of course, it's divide and conquer. Right. And, and of what they do is they focus in, obviously, on real problems. Women were getting shafted in many ways, but the elite didn't wasn't planning to help them. They were planning to really shaft them and take men away from them. Look at what they did with black families. You only had about 10% illegitimacy 50 years ago. Uh, in black communities, and now it's over 90%. And look at welfare. You were going to give you some money, but you can't have a man in the house. And, right. And so that was further to degrade the family, yeah. totally destroyed, uh, and, and, and now illegitimacy is over 50% in the general population. Right. Well, see, the whole thing is, is these people control the money, so they make all the rules. You understand? And, and they put whatever rules they want into effect. And the truth is, America has really become a socialist, communistic country. And nobody, everybody says it's a capitalistic country. It's not a capitalistic country. You know, how can it be capitalistic when you have a central bank? <laughs> That's the first, you can't, it can't be. You know, the it's money. It's a planned economy. It's a planned economy. It's, it's, it's a phony. If they want to create prosperity, they just print dollars. They just make dollars or put digits into the economy. And, they, and then, now you have prosperity. You don't have real prosperity. You don't have real manufacturing. You just have, you just have money being injected in. It's an infusion of credit. Which only the, makes the government go into more debt. Into more debt. My friendship with Nick Rockefeller was one where we, were, uh, we expressed ideas to each other and thoughts and philosophies. And he wanted me to become part of what they were doing and for me to become a member of the CFR and uh, offered various business opportunities for me to get involved in and for me to um, not take up the fight or the battle that I've been taking up in the past, you know, to drop that idea because what was the point of my fighting for the people? I was a guy who was very successful in the movie business and I saw the truth of what was happening. I tried to express it to the people and rather than having me express it to the people, they wanted me to join their side because I was a mover and a shaker and rather than me opposing them, to join them. It was real simple. And uh, he tried to recruit me into that situation, and um, I didn't go for it. Did he get angry when you didn't go for it? No, no. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, I remember one time he said to me, you join us, so you, ha so you have an ID card, Aaron, you know, you have a chip, and your chip will say KMA on it. And uh, I said, what does KMA mean? He said, it means kiss my ass. <laughs> and anybody stops you, a cop or whatever, and you show them your card or your chip, and uh, they'll, they'll not leave you alone because you're one of us. You know, and, uh, you know, wh why are you fighting for the people for? What, what is that about? The people are just, you know, th th they have to be ruled. They have, they have to be, you know, the, the Constitution, what, we, what you're standing for, is only for a few people. It's only a few individuals that can live that way. You know, and uh, we believe that it's best for society to be ruled by an elite people who uh, control everything. And I said, I don't believe that. You know, I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be and put everybody on this earth to be the best they can be, not to be a slave and a sheep to you and, and these people. And I don't understand why you want to control everything. What is the need for that? You know, and uh, I asked them to all the people in the Council of Foreign Relations feel the same way you feel? He said, no, a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. They think that socialism is the best way to go. They think that, uh, you know, uh, that they're doing the right thing. But the people at the top, they all know the truth of what's happening. And, and that's what so, it is. So it's compartmentalized within the elite structure as well. Of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, all the people that are in the CFR, was that two, three thousand people? I have to go to, like, Dan Rather. They don't know. They don't know. 
what's going on. They just they, they, they join the CFR because it's prestigious. They think it's good for business, it's good for this. You know, they don't know what's really happening. You know, we're, we're, the evil that comes out of it, that's emanating out of it. You know, and uh, to me, you know, uh, the biggest evil is what's happening right now because uh, this, what happened on 9-11 is a phony, you know, and we've never learned the truth about 9-11. That's the question yeah. I wanted to uh, follow up on. He tells you 11 months before there's going to be an event, all this is going to happen. What did you think on the morning of 9-11? Where were you, and did you think about Nick Rockefeller and what he had told you when you saw those towers fall? No, I, I was actually in Tahiti when 9-11 happened, and I got a call from my son, and um, my son said, the Twin Towers, they were just attacked, and they were falling down or something. So what are you talking about? I, I, I was in Tahiti. I was asleep. And uh, he says, yeah, they were hit by a plane, da da da, da. And so uh, where, I, where I lived, in, where I was in Tahiti, there was no television, so I had to run around the other side of the island to a hotel where they had, and it was all on television, you know. And that's when I first saw the stuff on TV about it. And I, I didn't immediately equate it to Nick, you know. But when I realized that we we're going to go into Afghanistan, <laughs> Iraq, and as that developed, I realized what it was. I mean, to me, uh, I, I see, I, I see people like Bill O'Reilly on television, right? And I see how much they control the media. Like there's this girl on Bill O'Reilly the other night uh, from an organization saying the world can't wait. And she, this girl was spot on. Everything she was saying was the truth. And all Bill O'Reilly could do was call her a lunatic. He couldn't challenge the facts. They, they just call people names. They can't, and, and until we just find that, look, this world, we're heading into a world of danger, possible nuclear wars, you know, because the banking industry is trying to take over the world. 9-11 is the beginning of the war on terror. That war on terror is leading us into Iraq, which is the next lie. So you had the lie of 9-11, how that happened. No, nobody knows how Building 7 came down. Okay, we know 9-11 was a fraud. The American people don't know it, but more and more of them are believing it. Okay, so that was the first lie. Besides the inception, I'm not going back to the inception of the Federal Reserve, that original lie. But 9-11 was the first lie in this present state we're in. 9-11 is the kickoff of the war against the American people and the people of the world. 9-11 was a phony. It's a fraud. It didn't happen the way they told us it happened. Now, because of 9-11, we then had the authority to go into Afghanistan and Iraq. Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Okay, so that was the next lie. Now they're talking about going into Iran. Now how would you feel if you were Iran and you had this big powerful country, America, go into your next door neighbor, take over, take over their oil fields, right? Wouldn't you be worried about what they were going to do to you? Of course you're going to be worried. But, uh, but the people of America don't think about it from Iran's point of view. They think about it from our point of view. So now we're going to send more troops into Iraq and keep building up because they want Iraq and the Middle East to become part of the New World Order. And uh, Iraq was using uh, Saddam wanted to start using euros instead of dollars, right? He was uh, messing up their, their whole consumption. Iranists want to start using euros instead of dollars. They are, they have. Okay? So I'm saying what they're trying to do is preserve their power. And one lie leads to the next lie, leads to the next lie. And until you get to the root cause of 9-11, which is supposedly the war on terror, will never solve our problems here. Should we send more troops into Iraq? Should we not send more troops into Iraq? Well, the truth is, the fact is, that it all goes back to this war on terror. Where did 9-11 come from? That's the root cause of everything. And until we have a full investigation, find out why Building 7 fell down, why they shipped all the steel out of America so quickly, you know, from the buildings, why, why all the... Um, things that don't make any sense about 9-11 until we find out why it really happened. You know, we'll never understand why there's a war on terror. And we'll never be able to prove that the war on terror is a phony, is a phony. You know, Nick and I discussed many things. One of the things we discussed, or he brought up in conversation, was reducing world population and felt that there were too many people in the world. In a way, I agree, there are too many people in the world, but I don't think I have the authority to say who's going to die and who's not going to die. You know, but they felt that uh, they want to reduce world population, and uh, he felt that it should reduce by half. 
He even mentioned to me once uh, that they, they were having a real problem trying to solve the Israel-Palestinian um, problem. And he talked to me once about uh, they were playing with the idea of bringing Israel to Arizona, you know, and taking all the people from Israel and giving everybody a million dollars and setting up Israel in the state of Arizona. Unbelievable. Just to, to, end that, to end that problem, because that, that, that's a problem that, they, that they're not in charge of, in a sense. They, they, they're not controlling that problem. They're very arrogant. They can do whatever they want to do. We have, and we, we've given these people the authority to create money out of thin air. And through that device, they control everything. And if you want to win the battle to stop that, you have to deny them the ability to create money. It's only because they can make money that they have all this power. They literally have the money machines. They have, they have the money machines. They can print it. They can do whatever they want to do. They own everything. Aaron, we take over pretty quick. If we were the guys that issued the money, everybody had to come give us real assets for the use of this money we just printed up. You know, people, people uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, uh, why in the world does the American government borrow money from the banks when they have the ability to create it themselves without borrowing it and paying interest on it. Why? And nobody can answer that question. Not one politician ever raises that. Why does the American government borrow money when they can create it without paying interest? Well, we did create it and, up until uh, 1913. 1913. And, and so people say, well, because if the American government does it, it'll create inflation. That's the answer. I say, well, let's look at it. The American government has the Federal Reserve do it, which creates the same inflation as if they did it, but also with the inflation, now you're getting massive debt. So with the Federal Reserve, you have inflation and debt. Now, if the American government made the money, backed by gold, which limited the amount they could make, you wouldn't have debt and you wouldn't have inflation. But, but inflation was only about 50% from the 1780s, I've looked it up, until the late 1800s. And then we had the central banks already trying to cause some panics, which they then used to push the Federal Reserve. And if we look at inflation since 1913 into 2007, uh, it's exponential. In fact, a dollar is worth about two pennies to what it was worth in 1913. Federal Reserve Chairman, former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, doubled the money supply from 2000 to 2006, uh, and then Edward Bernanke, the new Fed chief, came in and said he's going to double it again in the next few years, and then he said, oh, now I'm going to make the money supply numbers secret, and so now we don't even know, right. uh, but the evidence is they are just, I mean, in the curve of inflation, it gradually grows, and then suddenly at a point, it goes straight up, and it seems we've it's now... It's parabolic, reached, yeah. Yeah, parabolic. But the, but the thing is that uh, the only thing I disagree with you on, from uh, uh, early 1800 to 1913, there was no inflation other than during the Civil War, you know, when Lincoln was... was well, I'm talking about how much a dollar was worth, and I know... A do, uh, never changed. A dollar, there was no inflation in that whole hundred years. There was no inflation. People knew what the money was worth. They could retire. They knew what it would cost them to live their lives out. There was no problem. It was only since 1913 when the Fed came in that we created massive inflation and massive debt. So the what you said earlier, then there really wasn't inflation. There was no inflation. So, so you don't get inflation when the government issues the money, at least in the U.S. history. Well, well not, not, not if it's backed by gold. Well, exactly. But I'm talking about, and I did look this up, um, and I believe that if, that if you look after the country was set up, and some of the things happened with Andrew Jackson and the rest of it. There were points where it spiked and, and there were manipulations. There were points, mostly during the Civil War. Yeah. And mostly. that's because uh, Lincoln printed so much money. Exactly, it. exactly. That's right. But once that ended, but basically there was no inflation other than, uh, other than that during that short period of time. I mean, a loaf of bread was a loaf, of course, the same thing. People could plan their lives. Today, they, they, they plan the inflation. Now you have two parents working. Uh, they, can, they can't afford to, take, to, to pay for their family anymore. The kids are going to state-run schools now. The kids are being indoctrinated how to think. They're being given Ritalin. They're being given all these drugs. The whole country's being dumbed down. It's all because of the Federal Reserve System. And the Federal Reserve System and these bankers are responsible for the demise of America. 
And if we ever want to win this battle, you must shut down the Federal Reserve System. And we must shut down these bankers and restore sound money to this country. Will you talk a little bit about some of the families that own the private Federal Reserve, the stock in it? And I mean, obviously, you say you're not a big expert on Bilderberg Group, but you talk about how it's the same system worldwide. It is the same families. They meet and kind of set the policy each year, and then it goes to the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England, it goes to the CFR in the U.S., and then these are their management bodies uh, where they wield control, uh, really the de facto Congresses, uh, over the nation. So, I mean, I would like you to speak some about the families that own and run the Federal Reserve, and if you can't well, connect it into these other international bodies. Well, I, I can't speak to those families, because the, 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 I can only speak about you know what I know for fact. I, 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 everything else is speculation, and I don't like to speculate. You know, I know about Rockefeller because I, I was friends with him. We would talked about it, and I can tell you firsthand. What did Rockefeller that. tell you about the Federal Reserve and their family owning part of it? Well, uh, he said the New York Fed is the main controlling interest of the Federal Reserve System. They control the bulk of it. So the New York Fed is really the Federal Reserve System, even though there's 12 different banks. It's run by the New York Fed, and the New York Fed is basically the Federal Reserve System. So who's ever running the New York Fed is where, and, and the families that control it, control the New York Fed. And they're, they're, they're the main uh, uh, engine behind the Federal Reserve System. And that's a wing of the Bank of England. And well, the, well, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve are partners, you know, and the Bank of England is a private bank, and so is the Bundesbank in Germany, and the Bank of, all the, all the banks of the G8 countries are all private banks. The private central banks. And look, what happened in Europe? Didn't Europe vote down uh, the European Constitution? Yes. They're still doing it. Didn't they vote down the Europe? They're still doing it. They don't care what the people vote. They do whatever they want to do. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda. It's their plans that matter. Isn't that prima facie evidence of a tyranny? Well, we, there's no question we're in tyranny. There's no question we're living in a world where... Uh, uh, the American citizen is no longer a free individual human being to do uh, the things that they wish to do. You know, we're, we're slaves, and, and, and it's getting worse. What do we got to do to bring these people down? Got, you, I, in my opinion, uh, you must shut down the Federal Reserve System. And I think that um, there has to be an uprising. There has to be an uprising. People have to stand up. I, I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone, Alex. And uh, we need to get a majority of people, not a majority of people, but a... Uh, was 5% won the war against the British, a highly motivated group. But I agree, people have got to get angry first. I mean, not just, yeah, yeah, we know it's corrupt and that lack of discipline. we got to get pissed. People don't seem to have the courage to do what they have to do, you know? I want to say you've got a lot of courage. Oh, thank you. You know, I don't know if I have a lot of courage. I just have... Well, a, I want to thank you for what you're doing for my family. Oh, I have a sense of conscience and I have a sense of justice. You know, I, I get nervous about what I do, but I do it because there's no other choice. You know, I, I, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do it, you know. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, I've ostracized myself pretty much from Hollywood. You know, people are afraid to deal with me in Hollywood a lot because of what I do and the things I say. You know, I don't, I don't go along with routines. You know, a lot of people in Hollywood know the truth. They, they're not willing to stand up and speak about it. You know, and I know many of them have seen my movie, you know, and they know I'm right, and they won't talk about it because everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid because the federal, they, they think that this money they get, these Federal Reserve notes, are really money, and they think they have a comfortable lifestyle, and they're afraid of change. You know, they're afraid to stand up for what's right. And until people are willing to, to stand up and have the courage to do what they need to do, it's not going to change. And uh, hopefully... Uh, you know, uh, what, you, what you're doing, what I'm doing, what other people like us are doing can affect the change that people stand up and say, hey, I've had enough. The thing is, we have one, we have one advantage. that They need us to cooperate. See, if we don't cooperate with them, they can't win. And so they always need our cooperation to go along with their programs. So they try to sell us. Right. They try to sell us. Democracy, this is majority says this, believe in this, do this, do that. Do, 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 do that the, 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 the war on terror you know we got to be scared you know let yourself be scared. they're always trying to do things to sell us that will go along with them and once we learn not to cooperate with them then we win the game and that's the point don't cooperate with them don't go along with the program anymore stop it join forces you and I should run for president and vice president and take over this country 
and bring freedom back to this country. You know, that's what it's states like. Two people like you and I, statesmen, who believe in freedom, who believe in Thomas Jefferson and the Constitution and the founding fathers to, to make this country whole again. Because right now it's in the grip of the evil ones, you know. And uh, the only way to stop that is for good men to stand up. What Edmund Burke said, evil can only thrive when good men do nothing. Yes. Right? That, well, that we, we, we got, we've got to do something. That's what it is, you know. Uh, silence is golden, but when it comes to your freedom, it's yellow. You know, we have to stop being scared. We have to stand up and do what's necessary to take back, to stop these bankers, these elite, this government, full of lies, congressmen, full of liars, you know. People take, take destroying our borders, you know, creating a government. I mean, Im imagine this. You ha here you, ha you are in America, and they're combining America, Canada, and Mexico into one country, the North American Union, and the American people don't know anything about it. It's not even in the press. They'd rather talk about Rosie O'Donnell and Donald Trump calling each other names than discussing the fact that we're merging into one country. The press doesn't even report it. Or that Paris Hilton doesn't wear underwear. Yeah, Britney Spears. But I mean, who cares? I mean, the fact of the matter happens to be that that tells you how controlled the media is. Here you are combining America, Canada, and Mexico into one country, and you don't see it in the press. Unless maybe it's Lou Dobbs. You don't see it in the press. You just don't it see it. It should be the top story so, everywhere. Everywhere. And not worried about it, really. Why? That tells you there's the evidence that it's controlled. They don't want the American people to know what's going on. That's why they don't protect our borders. That's why we're losing our Constitution, the very document that secures our freedoms. Well, I think if you analyze the situation, and if you realize that since the Federal Reserve has come into being in 1913, illegally, without a constitutional amendment, by bribing a few senators during Christmas vacation, they turned over the most important power that the American government has, the creation and issuance of money, to a private bank. Through that private bank issuing money, they have destroyed this country. They have destroyed the purchasing power of the money in this country. They've created social programs that are destroying this country. Now, they've taken over our government, both Republicans and Democrats. There's no difference anymore between the two parties. They control both parties. It doesn't matter to them which one wins, because who's ever running for president will be someone they anoint, okay? Whether it's Hillary Clinton or John McCain running for president next year, which they're going to be people that are going to do what they want them to do. And the fact of the matter happens to be that you can't win an election unless you have enough money to win. They make sure who gets the money. Okay, so through that, through these bankers attempting to t taking over America, knowing that America was the freest nation in the world, it was necessary for them to take over America, take away our gun rights of, of uh, freedom to bear arms, and create a country where we, where we become slaves. Because once they take over America, the rest of the world becomes a lot easier for them. And so by creating 9-11, by creating an event, to terrify the American people that were being attacked by terrorists. You create a, a, a world where there's a, an enemy that can never be pinpointed. You can never win the battle. It's a hundred year war. It's a never ending war on terrorism. Right? So you're always fighting this war. And through the war on terrorism, which is the first, the 9 11, which is the first lie, then you create the war on terrorism, which is the next lie, then you create the war on Iraq for weapons of mass destruction, which is the next lie, and it's one lie to the next lie to the next lie, now it's going to be the Iran, the next lie, it's sending more troops in the surge into, into uh, Iraq. It's just one thing leading to the other. And it's always, with the event, with, it's always in the point of taking over more countries, more, more dominance, you know, making sure the American dollar, making sure the G8 stays in control of everything. And what they want to do is to control the American people, control the people of the world, put RFID chips in everybody, so everybody's a slave to these central banks. Did you ever talk to Nick Rockefeller after he told you all this and then 9-11 took place? No. 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 But he did, I told you, he told me that you're going to see men running around caves looking for Osama bin Laden. You know, you're going to see men looking for... You know, these guys, and they're going to be, 
you know. They told you it was all going to be bull. It was a phony. The whole thing is a fake. It's a fraud. Was he laughing or was he just coldly saying this? No, it was more laughing. Cynical. Laughing. You know, it was more like, how stupid everybody is. Look how stupid everybody is. We can do whatever we want to do. Well, it is ridiculous. It's like with Al Zakari. They claim they killed him like 14 times. <laughs> and they never said, well, we didn't kill him last time, but we killed him this time. They never even, ch now they're like practicing being ridiculous. Well, what about Bin Laden being in the American hospital, getting kidney, getting kidney help? Yeah. Right? In the American hospital. Yeah. Right? They, they could, if they wanted Osama Bin Laden, they could have gotten him. Oh, yeah. It was right in the American, after the coal. Well, every time our troops really would keep catching Taliban leaders, they would be ordered by the generals to let them go. That's come out in the newspapers, but only here or there. And they kept going, what's, and then Pat Tillman was complaining about it, and then he got shot. I've talked to his brother. Oh, you then, did? And then he got shot, and it was a big hero charging Al-Qaeda. No Al-Qaeda, he just somebody shot him in the back. Look, we're dealing with complete evil. We're dealing with complete evil. And until the American people wake up and say, we don't want this evil in our country anymore, and we want to come back to a country of decency and goodness and integrity and honor. You know, we're, we're going down that road. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take people to stand up and say, we don't want to live in this kind of a world anymore. You know, I believe we should pull all our troops out of Iraq. I believe we should leave other countries alone. Let other countries live their lives the way they choose to. You know, stop trying to spread democracy around the world, which is the worst form of government there is anyway. Restore our, restore our republic to what it's supposed to be. And, and, and go back to what the founding fathers gave us and uh, try and restore that, restore the republic. Look, the point, the point of everything is that we have to mobilize, each one of us. You and I can't do everything, Alex. You and I may be leaders, we may be, t we may be out there and people listen to us, so we have to say and follow us. But the truth of the matter happens to be, it takes all Americans to stand together, to stand tall, to mobilize and say, we're not going to take this anymore. I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. We're going to stand up and, 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 and fight the battle. And you and I can't do this alone. We're just leaders of the thing. But other people have to join in with us and stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and say, I'm not going to take it anymore. That's what it's going to take to win this effort and to stop cooperating with the government and with all their rules and regulations and to wake everybody up to hand out DVDs of my movie, to hand out DVDs of your movie, to educate everybody to what's going on. Well, freedom and liberty is what, Amer is what people are, really want, you know, and it's time to stop the duplicity of the government from lying to us. You see, many, many people know the truth of what's happening in this country. They know the truth, like the numbers you gave about 9-11, but they're afraid to stand up. People have to find their courage and stand up and say, I'm not going to take this anymore. I know the truth, you know, and uh, it's like they create a situation where if you tell the truth, you, you're considered uh, a lunatic. You know, in other words, if, if someone goes on a TV show and says, 9-11 is inside job, oh, you're an idiot, you're crazy. They call you names. You can't be afraid of that. Well, it doesn't so the work truth anymore. Is, I mean, they have no facts. Just calling you crazy doesn't make you crazy. Well, we know that. They also go get kooks, who are kooks, to put them on and then say they represent us. That's right, exactly. Another tactic. Exactly, exactly. And Bill O'Reilly's great at that. Sean Hannity is great at that. They just put people on who they can dominate, you know. But Why what, do you think guys like that, they're not stupid. I mean, I've taught people that know them. They know the truth. Why do you think they decide to join the evil? I, I, that has to be in their hearts. I mean, I had the opportunity to do that, and then in my heart I couldn't do it. So it has but, I mean, how could you or I consciously be involved in something like putting AIDS virus in black Africans' vaccines. I mean, what the hell? I mean, it, it, it's like, we're not good guys either. I mean, I don't think I'm like some special perfect person. What, what the hell's wrong with this elite? I mean, why are they running around doing evil? I mean, they just run around continually doing evil. Well, I, I, think, I think a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. I think a lot of them think they're doing the right thing. Not, not the top elite, but people within the system, you know. But I think that uh, it's, all, it's all about, uh, as Nick said to me, it's about control and power. They have all the money they want. They can make all the money they want. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world in their eyes. And, um, 
You know, you and I believe in individuality, in the person being the dominant thing, the individual being the dominant person. Today we live in a world where institutions are dominant, not people. You know, the American, you know, we the people by the people for the people. Now it's we the institutions by the institutions for the institutions. People are secondary. It's all about corporations and institutions. And the Federal Reserve is the biggest institution in the world. You know, if you ask somebody what's the biggest corporation in the world, they'll say uh, Google or Walmart or Exxon or something. But the biggest corporation in the world is the Federal Reserve System, right? And all the other corporations feed off the nipple of the Federal Reserve System. Well, it's like the Monopoly game. Uh, the bank always wins. It has unlimited money. It's not the people playing on the board. Exactly. The bank owns the board, the box, the right, the and shelf it's sitting on. So, so, but that's because you gave them the ability to make the money. You have to take that away from them. Well, you take the bank away from the private bankers. Exactly. You have to take the creation of money away from the private bankers, and you'll solve ninety-five percent of your problems. Well, let me look at America. Ten percent growth rates every year, like China's having right now. The U.S. had 10% growth rates until the Federal Reserve took over. And then if you look at that, it all starts really going downhill from there. And, and well, they destroyed the American worker. They, what they've done, here's what's happened. The, the Federal Reserve has created this massive inflation in America, which means that the American worker has to keep making more money to keep up uh, uh, with the cost of living. The more money they make to keep up the cost of living, the less competitive they become in the world economy. So now what happens is we have to pay our workers so much to keep up the cost of living, say, well, screw the American worker, let's go overseas now and get the cheap labor. But really that's and a war being waged against the middle class. Of course The it bankers is. print the money. The, I mean, really, this is a war being waged against the middle class. The bankers print the money. Everything they're doing is about destroying any private pools of wealth or independence. Yeah, but, the, but, the, but the, what I'm trying to say is because of the inflation that they've created, They've now allowed other countries to outcompete us. You see, because other countries don't have to pay as much money as we have to pay here to our workers to survive. Yes. So now we're not competitive anymore. So we've lost our manufacturing base. We've lost our competitive. In the in the old days, the American worker, you wanted to buy everything American. You wouldn't buy anything from Japan, which was cheap crap. And what does that leave us? It leaves America this military force, and so the elites giving us a deal. We'll continue to build up your military and give you homeland security jobs, shift your economy over to being the bulldog enforcer of the new world exactly. order. Exactly. Do, and, and by controlling the economy, they force everybody into that position. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. And we, 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 there's no more manufacturing here. We're a service economy. We do nothing. We provide nothing. We provide nothing to the rest of the world anymore. Well, first of all, Freedom to Fascism is a movie that everybody should see. Because we, 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 sh we, we show the fraud of the uh, income tax. We show how judges put people in jail for no reason. We, sh we show the corruption of the justice system. And we show how the Federal Reserve came into being and how it's controlling society. And, uh, the new, and how all the uh, central banks of the world are working together through the Bank of International Settlements in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, which is the central bank for all the central banks and how they all work together to create this one world government, the one world order, which is what they're trying to do. So uh, Freedom to Fascism is a movie just to get you a good basic education about how the world is really working. And I really want everybody to see that movie, critical. In terms of the uh, CFR, in terms of compartmentalization, I mean, there are many good people, I believe, that are part of these organizations who don't even understand what the organization's really about. People like, like when I was in Germany doing cancer treatment, uh, there was a gentleman there who was a, uh, visiting a friend of his who had cancer. And he was a member of the CFR. And uh, we were talking. And uh, I showed him the movie. He said, oh my God, I'm going to resign. I had no idea this was what the CFR was about. He had no idea. He was just a nice guy who thought he was in this prestigious organization. Yeah, a lot of it's about getting good people and, and so you can watch them. Keep your friends close, your enemies close. Well, no, no, it wasn't even that. It was, well, a lot of people join the CFR because they think it's a prestigious organization. <laughs> you know, it'll help them in business, make good business contacts. They don't they didn't have an understanding that the CFR is really about world domination. 
about uh, you know how they and the Trilateral uh, Commission, the Bilderbergers, all work together, you know, with the banks to control the people. They don't. A lot of them don't understand that. They don't see the big picture. Oh, it's CFR. It's a prestigious organization. I'll meet this one. I'll meet that one. I can do good business deals out of it. It's just business to them. The CFR wants to get the people in there that have influence and power, you know, and uh, uh, so they're part of that. So they're not. They're not opposing them, you know. It's like the the, the whole the whole country today is becoming the haves and have-nots. You're getting you're getting the very very wealthy. The middle class is being destroyed, and you're getting the poor people. Isn't this just a slick mafia that took over and, and, and uses fancy PR? Well, my, you, can, you can call it mafia, you can call it whatever you want, but it's, it's definitely a criminal organization. There's no question about it. But it's a criminal organization that has prestige, you know, that, has, that, that, that appears to have, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, class. Class, style, you know, it's like, you know, respected. It's respected. People don't look at it as being a criminal organization. That's what a great job they've done. You know, people look at Alan Greenspan as being a hero. You know, the maestro. Money, money, money's a funny thing. You know, I, I was talking to uh, Michael Eisner one day, and I said to Michael, you know, you know, you may have a billion dollars, Michael, but they're all dollars. You know, <laughs> you know, if the dollar goes bad, what, what, how much money are you going to have? You know, and that's the th and that's the thing. You know. You, you, you know, everything is denominated in dollars. Everybody thinks in terms of dollars, but the dollar has no value. And then someday, it's, it's you know, everything returns to the mean. Well, really, the whole universe, financial universe we live in, is a matrix fraud. Yes, it is. And that's why it's going to come crashing at some point. And they're going to try and hold up as long as they can. I mean, whenever they want to manipulate the markets, they can. If they want to send the price to go down lower, they can. If they want to send the stock market up, they can. They do that. There's no more free markets. You don't live in a you don't live in a society where free markets rule anymore. You don't live in a capitalistic society, you know. But meanwhile, they say it's capitalistic right. and free market all day when really they're waging war financially and politically. Exactly right. Aaron Russo, I want to thank you for this interview. Anything else you want to add? No, I'm happy. I'm happy to do do it for you. I'm How about your to, website? My website, freedomtofascism.com. Go over there, take a look at it, you know. But just folks, you know, all I can say is. You know, take our country back, restore the Constitution, don't let these bankers do this to us anymore. Stand up, don't be afraid of them, and uh, do what you got to do, you know. And um, I have plans in the works, and uh, when I get over my, my uh, problems, you know, I will, will reveal them, you know. And well, I'll uh, be supportive of that. Thank you, Alex. And listen, you've done a great job alerting people to the truth. And... Um, don't, 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 in other words, don't be afraid to be ridiculed by these people. You know, if 9-11 was a phony, and I know it was, then stand up and say it's a phony. Don't be, don't be scared to tell the truth. Don't allow their, um, you know, their, their powers of um, trying to make you look silly uh, to frighten you. What did you think of what Charlie Sheen did? I love what Charlie Sheen did. I was so... Are respectful of what he did. I was. I want. I. I just applauded him. People but, saw you know, right through that attack. They like they flipped the light switch and they went after him. Yeah, but you see, but they don't. You see, the thing is that more people don't come out and do it. You know, to build that wave. Charlie did it. I'm really proud of the guy. David Lynch life. did, but, they, but the media was smart and didn't bite this time. They the, it. Right. I mean, a few people have, but they're not picking up on it because they control the media. Brolin, James Brolin did on the View. I heard that. I heard that as well. But again, they're not picking Barbara up. Barbara Walters looks like she's about to have a heart attack. But they're not. But they don't pick up on it. You see, they they, they they don't they don't allow it to go anywhere. You know, it comes if someone says something, they let it die. You know, but they keep perpetuating. You know, the war on terrorism. They keep perpetuating all these things that are lies. And uh, because we've given the Federal Reserve the money making power, they control the media, they control the government, and they're all in bed together. So we, we, you're fighting all this propaganda all the time, and it's a very difficult fight.